So now, without further ado, let me introduce uh, Lisa Flynn. She's already, in a sense, introduced herself to those of you who were, were on and waiting for us to sort out our technical difficulties. But, uh, but as you can appreciate and you can see from the logo on the screen, she is um, been associated with uh, yoga. Uh, Childlike Yoga is the name of her nonprofit and yoga for classrooms for some years. Um, she was a yoga instructor once upon a time and realized that there was a huge appetite for uh, and a need for uh, programs that were you know, useful for working with kids. And uh, so she developed yoga for classrooms and childlike yoga to help make that happen. And uh, these are organizations that uh, she established that provide evidence-based yoga education for children in schools and communities and to professionals whose work supports the well-being of children. Um, as she mentioned a moment ago, she's developed two books. One's called Yoga for Classrooms Card Deck and Yoga for Children, uh, which was uh, published in the spring. And thank you, there it is on the screen. It was published by Adams Media. And, um, and we'll make sure that, uh, that you have her email address. I'll tell you what it is now, but we'll, put it, we'll make sure that uh, tomorrow when we send everyone who registered for this session a notification that the archive version is available for viewing, uh, we'll also include Lisa's email address. But for the record, it is lisa at childlightyoga.com. And again, we'll send that out uh, tomorrow and uh, to all those that, uh, that have registered, including those of you who are, who've uh, taken the time to join us tonight. So a welcome to all. And Lisa, a special welcome to you and over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's an honor to be here. And again, my apologies to those of you who are registered uh, a couple of weeks ago. I was quite ill and had to cancel at the last minute. Uh, I'm glad to finally be back. And um, it's great to see you all from all over the world. This is really fun. I love, I love the idea of webinars. I haven't done a lot of them, so uh, bear with me. But I'm really looking forward to this. Um, before we get started, what I'd like to do is just to jump in to uh, some interactive um, discussion. So we're going to start with a sequence. And this might be a sequence that you could do with your kids at home after school before homework. You could do uh, in the middle of the workday for yourself. And certainly, it's a great way to start the day. Or you could even use this as a transition. This is called a, a centering sequence, so a way to get everybody on the same page, to move our bodies and move our spines in the five main uh, ways that we can do that, waking up our bodies, getting some blood, blood flow. But also, we're able to do this right from a sitting position. So from a classroom standpoint, we can do this really quick and really simple um, without pushing our chairs back, without taking off our shoes and making a big ruckus in the classroom. Um, and that's what's so beautiful about yoga in the classroom. And the people think, oh my goodness, I don't have yoga mats. How am I going to do this? And there are all kinds of ways that you can do this. The Yoga for Classrooms card deck which I developed in the program itself is all designed around working in the space that we have with the time constraints that we have. So um, let's go ahead and try this. So I invite you, wherever you are, um, if you're in bed, maybe you could sit up just a little bit and put your legs over to the side of your bed. But for the rest of us who might be sitting in chairs, uh, let's go ahead and sit up nice and tall in our chair. And I'm going to have you scoot your bottoms a little bit forward so that your feet can be flat on the floor. So everybody take a look at your feet and make sure that your ankles are directly below your knees and that you're sitting right up on your sitting bones. And this is called sitting mountain. And what I'm going to do, um, we're going to do this sequence, sitting mountain, with the various activities following that. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and click through the presentation so that you can actually see the front and back of the cards that go along with these particular activities. So sitting mountain is all about um, engaging our center and our core, providing stability. Um, it provides a home base for any other movements that we do from a sitting position. And uh, certainly, it's a great centering exercise. Helps with focus and so forth. It's a great position to do our breathing exercises and so forth. So this is sitting mountain. And from here, and you can see it's really tiny on the back side of the card, but you'll see the here's an idea section, the little light bulb. Those are some other things that we can do right from this position. So neck rolls is one of them. So I'd like you to just gently lower your chin and elongate 
the back of your neck. This is your cervical spine elongating that area. So what you're doing is you're actually lifting your spine, okay? Almost like your head is on a puppet string and just gently lowering your chin and breathing in through your nose and out through your nose. If you have a cold, don't worry about it. You can always breathe in and out through your mouth. And that tends to be a common issue, particularly with working with young children. No worries there. So now we're going to roll our heads over to, well, my right. If you're watching me on screen, it'll be the left. It doesn't really matter too much. That's on a nice inhale. We're going to exhale coming back down to center, inhaling over to the opposite side, exhaling back down to center, and just kind of going back and forth. So the thing with neck rolls is you want to be really careful. Something that I try to avoid with children and adults really as well is rolling my head back. What tends to happen is that it really crunches our cervical spine. And so unless it's done properly, and that, that takes a lot of coordination and understanding to know how to do, uh, you really have to hold yourself upright. Um, skip it. I usually skip it with young children. Older children might be able to manage that. But frankly, if we're rolling our neck, we're really stretching out all the muscles um, and where we hold a lot of our tension in our upper back anyway. So that, that works out just fine. Some shoulder rolls now. Inhaling your shoulders up to your ears. Tense, tense, tense. Exhaling. You can even make some noise. Ah, an audible exhale here. Rolling them up. Exhaling them down. Nice. And we're still in our nice, solid, sitting mountain pose. Inhaling up. Exhaling. Ah. We all know kids love to make noise, so go ahead and let them exhale out. Inhaling up and exhaling down. Nice. And if we had a lot more time, we'd maybe go back the other way. Just go ahead and make noise. Notice that this, these activities are things that we can also do standing from Standing Mountain. And we'll see Standing Mountain a little bit later. The other one here is Crescent Moon. This is a side bend, okay? So we've lifted our spine. We've bent our cervical spine anyway forward, for the most part, and to the side. And now we're going to, we've rolled our shoulders, and now we're going to lift our arms up on a deep inhale. You can touch your palms together. I'll show you my palms. Or you can have them straight, okay? But the idea is that the shoulders are out of the ears, but we're lifted at the same time. And we're going to exhale to one side. Good. So inhaling upwards movement, exhaling to the side. I'm just going to flow with your breath. Inhale and exhale sideways. So this is a side bend of the entire spine. Do that a few times. And then coming back up and exhaling down. A few things that we can do right from seated mountain pose. For the sake of time, we're probably not going to do all of these, but I do want to show you the rest of the sequence. Cat and cow. So notice that cat pose is an upper body stretch. And as, just as the neck roll did, this is a forward spinal movement. But the beauty of this is that it's, you're really elongating and stretching and forward folding the entire spine, which is wonderful. So it's inhaling up. You can see the illustrations on the back of the card. And exhaling, pulling in the belly button, pushing the back of the spine towards the back of your chair. And you could even do a little paw press here. So pretending you're a cat, pressing your paws forward. Nice. And just flowing back and forth. We're going to move now from cat to open heart. And I am moving much more quickly through these than I typically would when working in the classroom or even with adults. With open heart, we're going to grab the back of our chair. So depending on what kind of chair you have, you might be grabbing the sides of your chair. There might not be a back. Um, you can grab the back of your chair. You can grab the sides of your chair towards the back um, behind your bottom. And we're going to breathe in and roll our shoulders back. Can you see my shoulders rolling back? And open up the chest here. A lengthen the neck. We don't want to crank it. We want to lengthen and lift the chin to the sky. Breathing in and breathing out. 
notice when you breathe in and out in open heart how much more oxygen you can bring into your lungs than when you're sitting upright and certainly much more so than when you're slunched over. So open heart is a fantastic pose or position to do with your breathing if you've in fact been hunched over a desk all day, okay? We tend to um, not have, not be using our full lung capacity when we're at a desk. So you can think of our students. Why do our students yawn all the time? Is it necessarily because they're bored? Not necessarily. It's their body giving them a signal that they're not getting enough oxygen into their body. Therefore, we love yoga because yoga incorporates so much breathing. In fact, yoga is breathing. Open heart. <clears throat> the next one is corkscrew. So we've done a side bend. We've done a forward. We've done a backward. We've done a lifting. What's left? Twisting. So just you can simply follow the instruction here. I know it's tough to see me, but I'm in my sitting mountain pose still, and I'm going to cross my left hand over my right leg. I'm going to reach back with my right hand to the back of my chair. I'm going to inhale up, lengthen, exhale, and twist to look behind. So my whole spine is in a twisting motion as well. I'm twisting and releasing all the toxins from my internal organs. I'm helping with my digestion. I'm gaining a new perspective. There are all kinds of benefits here. Breathing in and breathing out. You might breathe in and out three or five times before switching sides. And for the sake of time, we're just going to to do that now. So taking your right hand, crossing over your left leg, reaching back with your left hand to the back of your chair, Inhaling, lifting up, exhaling, and turning behind. Beautiful. I can't see you, but I know you're doing a beautiful job. Inhale and exhale. You can even feel the movement and the heat being generated as you sit here in this gentle twist in your internal organs. And exhaling back to center. Beautiful. So it's really important when we're working with kids, particularly, that we start them out with some type of dynamic movement. So imagine working with, um, I don't know, a seven-year-old boy in a first or second grade classroom, and uh, they just came back from recess, and you come in and you, like, you're thinking, oh, this would be a good time to do some um, yoga transition. Absolutely it would, but if you try to get them to sit down and be absolutely still and quiet with some super quiet and meditative activity, it's going to be a tricky transition. We need a way to get them down to that. So I like to start with movement and then move down towards um, a nice breathing exercise and then a, what we call a mindful meditation. So this is our breathing transition. This is called balloon breath. Really popular breathing. Um, it's a take on our three part breathing, which you may know of from uh, adult yoga class for those of you who are out there who are yogis. Um, go ahead and sit up tall in your sitting mountain pose. Of course, this can be done standing or lying down as well. Go ahead and put your hands on your belly. <coughs> you can imagine that there's actually a balloon in there inside your belly. So you're going to breathe in through your nose. And when you do, you're going to inhale and slow up that balloon in your belly just as big as you can. So typically, we walk around breathing from our chest. This is a belly breath. So breathing in, letting your diaphragm fall down, letting your lungs fill up, and letting your belly stick out. And then exhaling and drawing your belly in, letting all that stale old oxygen come back out. Diaphragm comes up. Lungs come in, all of that, uh, uh, exhaling all of that stale air. Nice. Inhaling, again, big balloon bellies. I actually do this with the kids, and I show them with my hands the expansion of my belly, and then exhaling back and down. Nice job. And one more time. Inhale. And exhale. Nice. Um, I don't have one in front of me here. I should probably have one. But it, do you know what a Hoberman sphere is? They're those wonderful um, mesh-shaped balls that if you hold the sides, 
they actually open big and they're really colorful and then they close. I even have um, glow-in-the-dark versions of these. We have them in our boutique at childlightyoga.com, but you can get them anywhere. And it's a wonderful visual for kids in the classroom. It's a real, real hit. They're called Hoberman Spears. Hoberman, H-O-B-E-R-M-A-N. Wonderful to use with uh, balloon breath. And they like to do it themselves. It helps with pacing. They don't want our kids to be over-oxygenating. It's something to keep in mind. So that's our breathing transition. And now we have a card um, in the Yoga for Classrooms card deck. It's called Mindful Meditations. It has a whole lot of quick and easy mindful meditations on the back. Um, a lot of them are based on using the senses. So you can imagine when we're really focused on using one sense or the other, we're really in that sensory experience. Experience. We are fully in the present moment. And that's really what being mindful is all about. So we're not going to do this right now, but what I was hoping to do was something called chime listening or candle gazing. I'm going to show you my little candle uh, right now. If you don't have one of these, this is like, this is magic. These little um, LED color changing battery operated candles, I don't know if you can see that, but it's actually changing, it's actually changing colors. It goes from blue to green to red. It's hard to see on the screen. Um, this is a wonderful thing to provide as a visual to kids to give them something to focus on. So it's one thing to say to children, okay, it's time to be quiet and I'm going to time you, versus putting one of these little candles on each of the pods of their groups of their desk, dimming the lights, playing some soft music, breathing with them, and allowing them to be silent and still and keeping their eyes on the candles. It's called candle gazing. So there's that. There's all kinds of other activities. But any of these wonderful mindful meditations bring the kids into the present moment. And, of course, that's where they, exactly where they need to be to be ready to learn. So thanks for joining me with that. Um, quickly, let's talk about the challenges. So what are the challenges? There are a lot of you here with me this evening. Um, there are a lot of people coming to my trainings and more and more to the workshops. We have a lot of interest in our program and other programs in bringing yoga and mindfulness education into schools. Um, why is that? Why is that? Why are, what's happening with our children? What's happening with education? Well, certainly there are increasing academic, academic demands. For those of you out there who are educators, I don't need to explain that to you. Um, we have, you know, in the United States, a new core curriculum. We have standardized testing. Curriculum is changing all the time. Um, there's a lot of workload for the kids. It seems to be increasing. So it's creating, certainly that can create a lot of stress and anxiety for everybody, um, staff and students included. What else is going on? Well, there are a lot of technological advances. Games, social media, electronic communication. Um, doesn't leave a lot of time for unstructured free, free play. We're really overscheduled as well. Um, so we don't have a lot of that time for the personal and social skills development that perhaps you and I had, some of you who are a little bit older on the call, you and I certainly had. We were thrown outside at, you know, 8 o'clock in the morning. We weren't expected till the dinner bell, you know, at 6 o'clock. Um, so we found things to do without them being scheduled for us. And that certainly allowed for a lot of opportunity for creativity and social skills development. What else is going on? We've got a super chaotic culture. So speaking of being overscheduled, um, we've got a fast-paced culture, competitive culture, um, there's often too much stimuli for young bodies and minds to process and absorb. Um, I know my own son, one of the motivations for me even doing this work is my own, my own son suffers, excuse me, from sensory integration disorder. So for those, I know that we've got a couple of OTs on, on the uh, webinar tonight. You certainly know what that is. But since he was a baby, you know, he came out of the womb and, and everything was just too much for him to process. So, um, you know, I, I can understand. I, I sometimes wonder if I myself have, have the same have the same issue. Um, and it is such a culture that we live in, it's certainly uh, exaggerated. And finally, we have a lot of kids, um, as we always have, that are in perhaps unsafe, unsafe, quote unquote, environment. So that could mean anything from uh, living in an adverse situation to bullying at school. Um, you know, even those kids with the sensory integration issues or perhaps a child who's on the autism spectrum in a, in a being in a regular classroom and having, having all the, the sensory stimuli coming at them, um, that in fact could feel like an unsafe environment and certainly add to uh, their, their stress. So 
stroke. As a result, we have a, many numbers of us, kids and adults alike, having issues related to self-regulation. And when we can't self-regulate, guess what? We're going to be out of balance emotionally. Our attention is going to suffer and our learning is going to suffer and our behavior is probably not going to be um, at our best either. <clears throat> so what happens with our brain? When we are stressed, this is, this is neuroscience, when we are stressed, it actually damages the architecture of our brain. So it leads to all kinds of issues with learning, behavior, and overall health. This is just a little chart I pulled together. This is, the, this is kind of the cycle of what happens. So we get stressed. Whether it's real stress or not real stress, our body reacts to it in the same way. So we go into this survival mode, this fight or flight mode, and our amygdala and our hypothalamus go into overdrive and produce all these hormones in our body. And then all of a sudden, um, the information that's coming into our brain gets blocked and it can't get to the front part of our brain, our prefrontal cortex that's responsible for all of this cognitive function. Um, behavioral regulation, and certainly long-term uh, learning and memory. So we suddenly have difficulties in all of those areas. So here's what we know. Executive function difficulties are related to suboptimal brain function, so not the best brain function. Brain functions, though, however, this is the good news, can be altered by regular sustained practice. This is called neuroplasticity. We can build new neural pathways in the brain with regular sustained practice of anything, building new habits. This is good news. The developmental window of opportunity for doing that, ages 5 to 12. This is why I do what I do and hope probably why you're on the call as well. We recognize, those of you who are early childhood educators, I saw there are a lot of you on here, you recognize this, you know this. Yoga and mindfulness within the SEL, SEL stands for social, emotional, and emotional learning. Yoga and mindfulness within the SEL framework can help strengthen executive functioning and the ability to regulate emotions, attention, and behavior. Increased emotional control, self-regulation, and metacognition are sort of our willingness to, to know what we know or think about thinking leads to a more reflective learning environment. Sustained attention and motivation toward a task lead to creative problem solving. Again, this is all really good news. If you haven't heard of this book uh, by Herbert Benson, The Relaxation Response, I highly recommend you go and pick up a copy. It's been a long, around for a long time, 1975. Um, Herbert Benson is a Harvard physician, a researcher, and obviously an author. And he has done a lot of work back in the 70s when people thought, um, you know, sort of this contemplative mindfulness meditation thing was was hokey and strange uh he was the one raising the flag and saying oh no no you know from a medical perspective this is amazing and it's really doing a lot um for all kinds of issues and medical issues that are related to stress <clears throat> what he said was when we in our bodies can elicit the relaxation response which is the opposite reaction to the fight or flight Okay. When we can do that, um, it's very beneficial. It counteracts the physiological effects of stress. So that's our sympathetic nervous system going into overdrive. And it brings the body back to our pre-stress level. So it engages our parasympathetic my goodness, nervous system. So research, and he and research, showed that regular use of the relaxation response can really help with any health problem that's caused or exaggerated or exacerbated by chronic stress. Everything from learning issues to um, fibromyalgia, right? So all, all across the board. Here's what happens. When we're stressed, our breathing rate, blood pressure, heart rate, metabolism, blood sugar, adrenaline, sensory awareness, the stress response to bring those up. So at the same time, our ability to think clearly, make rational decisions, be creative, our concentration, our immune system, our digestive system, and all kinds of other things plummet. The relaxation response has the opposite effect on all of those things. So when we can, through breathing, through movement, and we'll get to that, when we can elicit the relaxation response, 
and engage our parasympathetic nervous system, the exact opposite happens. Our breathing rate slows down. Our blood pressure goes down. Our heart rate, our blood sugar. And at the same time, all of our thought processes and our ability to be creative and uh, make rational decisions and so forth improve. So what's the solution here? What are we saying? We can help our children and ourselves, by the way, reduce reactivity to stress by learning to evoke the relaxation response. We can do that. We can teach our kids to do that. Here are the techniques that are scientifically proven to elicit the relaxation response. Visual imagery, progressive muscle relaxation, repetition of a word or a phrase like chanting or praying. Uh, mindfulness meditation, repetitive physical exercise, and focus on the breath. Surprise, surprise. This is a list that was developed back in the 1970s by Herbert Benson that, lo and behold, is exactly what we do in yoga, specifically with yoga for children. So what is yoga? We don't have to read this line by line, but certainly it's been around for a while. Um, it's sometimes associated with Hindu and Buddhism, but yoga today is practiced worldwide by those of many diverse cultures and religions. Um, it's an ancient discipline designed to empower health, happiness, and a greater sense of self. And really it, what it means, in a nutshell, it's a system of connecting the whole self, body, mind, and spirit. Spirit is what they say traditionally. If you think of spirit, though, and the root word, um, I think it's spirere or something like that in Latin. I don't know how to pronounce it but it means to breathe or respire. So when I'm working with kids or people who don't know a lot of yoga and might be kind of wigged out by the word spirit, it's a whole other conversation. I like to say it is the integration and connecting of the body, mind, and the breath. And certainly it is. So yoga involves mindful breathing, movement, and awareness building and focusing activities. And certainly it is very, very steeped in mindfulness. In fact, yoga is mindful. You can't practice yoga without being mindful. So what is mindfulness? We're hearing a lot of this word, um, mindfulness in education, yoga in education, yoga and mindfulness in education. Mindfulness is just this. It's an open, undivided, non-judgmental, non-reactive, present-centered awareness to and an awareness of what is happening within as well as around oneself. In a nutshell, it means to be with what is in the present moment. Mindfulness practices improve a set of mental abilities to adaptively and effectively shift attention when needed, successfully self-regulate the feelings and stress, concentration, certainly, concentrating deeply on an ob object, task, or thought, uh, being open to experience, free the, freeing the mind from habitual automatic thinking, so sort of breaking those old habits, uh, nurturing and appreciating all subjective experiences. Um, before I continue on, I think if there's a Linda on the call, I'm wondering if maybe you have your microphone on. Linda, you keep popping up like you're on, on the call, and I'm getting a lot of background noise. If everybody could just check to make sure that their microphone is not on, that would be fantastic. Thank you. So there's a lot of research coming out around yoga mindfulness and yoga and mindfulness for school children. So yoga in the classroom, yoga in the schools, whether it's on the mat or in the classroom in the chairs. These are just a little bit of a summary here of some of the studies, um, bigger studies that have been done. There are so many more that are coming out. Um, <clears throat> I just went to the symposium on yoga research put on by the International Association of Yoga Therapy in June. We had our own study, which I'll talk about in a second, presented, and there were you know, a good handful, I would say a quarter of the, the posters that were presented were related to um, yoga for youth, yoga in the schools, and um, there was an entire big, huge presentation um, part of the conference on that subject as well. So this is definitely something on the minds of many, both researchers, both um, educational advocates and policymakers. This is our little study. I, I won't tell you the full details. I'm going to give you the really quick overview, but uh, you can learn a lot more about this on our website. It's a very small study, a pilot study. Um, we looked at a uh, sample size, 36 students in second and third grade classrooms, so not a lot of kids. Uh, we didn't have a control group. 
but uh, we worked with the University of Massachusetts Lowell Physical Therapy Department, and it was really fun. They came in. We did some cortisol testing. We used the attention network test to test um, attention, you know, before and after these interventions, and we certainly did some teacher surveys as well. Um, and we looked at both acute and longitudinal effects of a 10-week program. So before and after one session, and then before and after the entire 10 weeks. And uh, most interestingly, what came out of it was that the teachers perceived overall improvements in uh, both of the second and third graders in these areas, social interaction, attention span, ability to concentrate on their work, ability to stay on task, academic performance, ability to deal with stress and anxiety, and confidence and self-esteem. Really, really interesting. Um, they did a survey before they had any understanding or knowledge or training in the program upon each individual student and where that student was at at that time. And then 10 weeks later, following their training, following the 10-week um, intervention, they filled out another survey. And um, on the same students with no access to the information that they had filled out before, and um, the statistically significant results were seen in these areas, and that was really that was really fun. Um, I think we're going to be presenting again at, at another uh, conference, which I'll tell you about a little bit um, in February. So, what is yoga for classrooms? Well, it's our mission, and really the mission of a lot of yoga and mindfulness um, programs out there for schools. It's our mission to transform and help educational environments through yoga-based wellness training and support. So we empower students and educators to work together to create positive, peaceful, productive classrooms that support their learning and also support skill building and a skill set that will help them develop a lifetime of physical, social, and emotional health and wellness. Our curriculum and many others uh, address the whole child. We are focused on social, emotional, and attentional self-regulation skill building. Certainly being very grounded in mindfulness and yoga practices, which we just talked about. The program is developed to cultivate well-being, resilience, and lifelong learning, and certainly promotes peaceful, productive, learning-ready classrooms just inherently. Um, also encourages a positive school culture and community building, bringing the class community together, creating a safe space um, specifically designed for the space and time crunch classroom. We talked about that earlier. Simple, accessible, and easy to use. If this was really complicated, nobody would be able to do it. So that was sort of the idea behind Yoga for Classrooms and the card deck, is to create really simple tools that you don't need a ton of training to just jump right in and do and benefit from with your kids. Um, Cost-effective and, and sustainable. It's a whole child health and wellness program. For those of you, and I know a few of you were commenting in the chat box that, that you have the deck. It's right next to you as you're on this webinar. It's so great. So if you have it, you'll know that there are six categories of activities in the program, really, again, really addressing that whole child. So there's certainly stretching. Um, there's certainly yoga postures. There's certainly breathing. But we also have community builders, uh, the loosen up section, uh, also creative movement visualizations, imagination vacations, uh, creativity boosting activities, and our Be Well category, which really kind of encompasses everything else that it is to be a whole healthy person. You know, um, being grateful, having gratitude, how does that figure into the mix? Having a positive attitude, being respectful, um, being a peacemaker, going outside, being in nature, being with yourself, and being reflective. Those are all really important components to being a whole healthy person. Um, as is eating nutritionally and drinking enough water and getting enough sleep. So those are all sort of health and wellness um, topics that we discuss as part of the program. And again, um, those are available in the card deck. So our, our approach is similar to many. This is how, how we phrase it. Um, there are really three major steps to integration. So First, we have to be mindful. We have to notice where we are at any given moment. So noticing through mindfulness practices, students learn to note their current state of being without judgment. Hey, I'm really hyper right now. Or, hey, I'm kind of dragging right now. Or I'm frustrated right now. You know, where am I? And then with having built some understanding um, and using these very simple yoga-based tools, we can make then a mindful choice well, what tool might I use or what tools might I use to help myself self-regulate? 
and then we do so. And then following that, we are able to reflect on the experience. It's a big part of our program. When we present um, a class or a sequence, we're not just presenting it and moving on. We actually have a little discussion after. You know, how was that experience for you? What happened in your body? What happened in your mind? What happened with your breathing? So that they can start making those connections for themselves. Huh, I was feeling this way. Here's what I did to regulate myself. And now I'm at this point. Um, maybe it worked, maybe it didn't. Most of the time it does, though, and they're able to reflect on it. And from there, they can then integrate it into their future um, so they can integrate what they've learned for future applications. So, huh, if I feel this way again, maybe that will come to me more quickly. And certainly, like anything, when we can build these habits through the class day, at home, on the playground, um, then we're getting somewhere. We're starting to build those neural pathways in the brain to develop those new habits. So in the classroom, and again, this is applicable everywhere, but in the classroom, yoga movement and stretching activities, breathing, mindfulness, they can all be used as standalone lessons, or that you can even integrate them if you're a teacher into your academic or guidance curriculum. Actually, I have a lot of school counselors inter interested in this program. Um, the American School Counselor Association uh, is having me, had me present last year, and, and they, were, they immediately noticed all the connections um, between this type of contemplative education and their um, school ASCA standards. So when might you integrate in your classroom? Well, morning meeting, uh, transitions, pre-testing after lunch, really any time as a community builder at the close of the day to take a break. Uh, the list goes on. There's a little picture here of first grade students and a classroom teacher practicing balloon breathing um, during one of our residency lessons. So there's Sharon, the trainer in the front. The kids are, are following along and the teacher is joining in as well. And the idea of the residency is to really model for the classroom and for the teacher so that it can be sustainable, it can continue on uh, once we're finished in this classroom. So how can you use yoga and mindfulness outside of the classroom? There are all kinds of times to do that, anywhere, anytime. That's the beautiful thing about yoga and mindfulness um, activities. Once you have a set of tools that you can use, you pull them out whenever it makes sense to address the particular needs of the child, of yourself, the current situation, and how much time you have. <clears throat> so here are a few sequences. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time to go through all of them, so I'm going to just kind of zip through here and um, show you some examples of various sequences that you could use to address a particular situation. So here's a great one for kids who are suffering anxiety. So for example, pre-testing situation causes a lot of anxiety for a lot of kids uh, and teachers for that matter. Um, so here's a nice little sequence. Washing machine, which incorporates um, a nice slow twisting motion, uh, power breath, energizing, empowering, posture prep, Getting ready, getting our muscles and posture and brains and fine motor skills ready to sit and take a test. Um, picture it tree. Picture it tree is uh, all about positive thinking, building confidence, um, affirmations. It introduces the idea of affirmations to children and certainly helps to empower them. Another sequence, um, well, actually, this isn't a sequence. Uh, this, these are, again, I've already talked about this card, the mindfulness meditations. There's a whole variety of um, opportunities to engage um, present moment awareness. So the candle gazing, the outside in um, listening, uh, tasty focus exercise using the sense of taste and so forth. Great ways to center, quick and easy. Balancing high energy, that's a common one and a common need. So countdown to calm breath, the blue cards are breathing exercises. Some are energizing, some are calming. Certainly countdown to calm is going to be a calming um, breath. It actually takes a lot of focus because you're using your fingers. Um, chair pose is a very challenging pose. So kids who are super high energy, they need to use that energy and they need to get it use it and it have it be in a structured way that they're able to use it. So particularly in a classroom, chair pose is great. Tree pose, you've gone from chair pose, you've given them an opportunity to use their muscles and get out some of that excess energy, and then you move into tree pose, which requires more focus and balance, but is also still challenging. And then light bulb brain is all about, um, it's a visualization, 
It's about resting and relaxing and, and restoring, giving our bodies and brains a chance to rest. Oftentimes, when kids are acting very high energy, sometimes it's because they're exhausted. And I know that's counterintuitive, but I've noticed that time and time again, both in my children's yoga classes um, and in the school. <clears throat> A uh, lot of self-deprecating thoughts, I find. Um, I can't do it. This is too hard. Um, we, we hear a lot of that. And there's a lot of pressure on kids. And I think their, their MO these days is to sort of say, oh, it's too much. I can't do it. Because they're, they're, it's almost out of fear of failing. Um, so empowering and positive thinking is something that we focus on a lot in our program. So here's a little sequence, um, certainly ocean breathing. Um, you know, focusing, centering, um, providing flow, but then the warrior series. So if you know yoga postures, you'll know that warriors, the energetic qualities of a warrior are strength and power and so forth. So the warrior series, I love to do that uh, as an exercise. The gratitude relaxation is an imagination vacation, our visualization, and it's all about um, remembering Remembering all that we have to be grateful for. So talking about what is gratitude and then remembering that. And there's something very magical, as you probably know, that when we're able to remember and take a minute and remember all that we have to be grateful for, it really helps to put everything else in perspective and gives us a positive mindset. Very powerful activity. Uh, so in the classroom, with the right tools, classroom teachers and others who work with children can develop the ability to address the particular makeup moment to moment and the needs of their kids or individuals. As they build self-awareness themselves and they receive the modeling encouragement that they need from you, they'll begin to proactively assist with this process. They'll know what to do with your assistance. This repetition and reinforcement promotes that integration and sustainability. There's some reflections here on integration. Um, we're running out of time, so I won't spend too much time, but. Um, these are some reflections from uh, school principals and other staff educators on, on, on integration and what they're seeing. The kids are really taking away from doing these activities and during the class day. Um, students are now choosing to use yoga tools to cool down or gather their thoughts without any prompting from me. This is from a school counselor. The kids are really getting that this is something they can use anytime. I think they're showing their learning to their parents is indicative of the carryover, and um, that, that, is, that is incredibly true. One of our third grade boys was frustrated. He used breathing strategies, slowed down, even cried a little bit. It's all right. And then he was able to share about his frustration and return to the activity, being aware of his mind-body tension and knowing what, it's, what to do. What a relief for him. That's from Vicki Stewart, a local school principal, uh, who is a huge fan um, of yoga and mindfulness in the school. Student reflections. So what are the kids saying? Um, they say all kinds of things. Some are really cute, actually, but um, some basics. You know, I used to get really angry, but now I know I can calm myself down if I just take a deep breath. Sometimes I need to do a few, though. <laughs> um, he, he is a student with sensory integration disorder. I like to take yoga breaks because I can fo focus and concentrate better afterwards. This is a student with Asperger's syndrome. I like being a peacemaker. My friend was being mean, but I remembered what you said, that maybe she was feeling left out. This is one of our peacemaker activities. So I asked her to play with us, and she hugged me. She's still mean sometimes, but I think that before I would have run away. So this student would have, you know, if, if encountering a challenging situation might have taken off, and now she's feeling more confident and has some skills and tools to make a different choice. <clears throat> Teachers and staff, it's really important for you all on this webinar to remember to take care of yourself. So teachers, parents, caregivers, we all benefit much the same way as our kids. This isn't all about the kids. This is actually, we can't even teach this to kids unless we're practicing ourselves. So, so take the time to do this for yourself as well. Take the time and the opportunity for taking yoga and mindfulness breaks during the day um, to be sort of a time in for yourself, for your own self-care and recovery from classroom rigors or home life rigors, uh, leading to a more mindful, compassionate teaching and learning experience for yourself and the kids that you work with. A few teacher reflections on that concept. I'm more calmer, more in tune with my students' needs. I wasn't expecting that I can do this. This particular person um, 
was, uh, she was a, a, a school speech pathologist. She was recovering from cancer. She was very anxious coming into one of our workshops. And um, she was pretty inspired that, that this is all very accessible. This is not rocket scientists. You do not need to be a gazillion hour certified yoga teacher to do this work and share it with kids. Um, it, it's really, it's pretty simple and it's extremely beneficial for all who involve themselves. So three quick steps to success here. If you're feeling really inspired um, to, to integrate more yoga and mindfulness into your class day with your own students, if you're a parent, and you're inspired to bring it to your school. If you're a yoga teacher on this call, a kids yoga teacher, and you want to know more about um, getting trained to do this work, certainly you've got to prepare. You've got to get training, do some research. I've got some resources here coming up in another slide or two with how you can do that. Um, certainly our program, but there are many others out there as well. So depending on where you are geographically, there might be another choice. Um, and then invite, invite. We don't want to force anything on anybody, right? So we can only educate invite, embody, and live this work ourselves, and uh, eventually people will join in. And then we can serve, and then we can go out, and uh, we can do this work. Really simple. I have a whole other webinar just on these three key steps, <laughs> but um, just in a nutshell, you know, make sure you get trained first. You know, don't jump in without having the training. Um, we get really passionate about things, and sometimes we get really attached to things working out, or we want everybody to believe in the same things that we believe in. Take a step back, invite, model, and allow it to unfold naturally, and then you'll be able to serve with great success. Um, you can learn a lot more about our program, of course, on our website and our blog. You can subscribe to our e-newsletter. We have lots of really interesting um, articles on our blog. Marina Ebert and I write a lot of articles together. She's the one, my colleague, who uh, we co-wrote the article for the Brain Teacher, and I'll try to bring that up in a second if uh, Tim doesn't. Um, but it, it, you can find that on our blog. Just go to our blog, yogaforclassrooms.com slash blog, and type in the search field, Green Teacher, and the article will pop right up for you to take a read. But there's all kinds of other articles in there related to that, um, addressing the religion question, specifically how does yoga promote executive functioning? How does school yoga support social-emotional learning? Um, lots of information about the research coming out, so on and so forth. Um, we have the professional development opportunities uh, available in 15 different states and also Canada now. I know Greek teachers based in Canada, um, which is interesting, um, and certainly opportunities to be trainers as well. <clears throat> some other helpful resources. These are some of my favorite books. I've got some of them here, obviously my own books. But um, Starbright Visualizations, More Visualizations for Children, Imaginations, um, Starbright. You can... Just go to Amazon uh, and look these up. Uh, Yoga Calm for Children, a great program. Uh, also books, they have books um, as well. The Ready, Set, Relax program is fantastic. Um, they just came out with the CD as well. Oops, I don't know if you can see that. The CD, I just got this in the mail actually, so I'm going to be listening to it in the car on the way to Pennsylvania to facilitate a training this weekend. Um, there's that, and then they have the teen version, so that's kind of the elementary school, and they just sent me this as well. This is their new teen book and uh, CD all about uh, relaxation and using, you know, yoga and mindfulness and relaxation um, for learning and otherwise. Um, helpful websites here. Um, other school yoga and mindfulness programs, these are some of my favorite uh, colleagues out there doing fantastic work, whether it's on the mat or in the classroom, whether it's yoga or mindfulness or both. Um, remember that yoga is mindfulness, so it, it's all uh, very much tied together. And that is all I have, and I would love to uh, see some questions. I haven't had a chance to thank look you. down Thank you, Lisa. Here. I'll, I'll jump um, in here. Uh, and yeah. uh, yeah. and I, in fact, I did thank pick you. up two questions, which I can pass on to you. Uh, oh, great. But, but I will ask, uh, but I will do as you just did a moment ago and invite anyone who's got a question uh, to type it into the chat box uh, for all of us to see. And, and uh, we'll make sure that Lisa uh, gets to them. But Lisa, yes, while, while people are doing that, let me ask a, one question was uh, uh, when you did the introductory exercises um, and you were talking about um, one person said uh, that she, I think it was you were, you were introducing us to the sitting mountain yes. uh, exercise or 
movements, and she said uh, her students sit on exercise balls. Yes, um, excellent. And of course, in the and, and is it is it possible to do the sitting mountain mm -hmm. exercise on exercise balls with relative safety? Yes, yes. In fact, if you think about what sitting mountain is, I love exercise balls because you're forced to sit in sitting mountain. You really can't sit any other way on an exercise ball. You have to have your feet sort of spread apart a little bit. You've got to have your your um, ankles under your knees. You need to be sitting upright. You start doing this and you start to roll, right? So um, exercise balls are fantastic. Now, certainly when you're doing side bends on an exercise ball, it's going to be a lot more work. It's going to be a lot more challenging and there's more, there are going to be more apt to fall over and at the same time, isn't that great? So you're getting even more out of the, the sitting um, postures and activities um, here than at the, the at your desk activities, the orange cards, than you even would in a chair. Um, so the younger the kids, the, the more careful you want to be. Um, you want to take some precautions. You don't want anybody falling backwards. Um, so I always have the kids, like, you know, if they're on balls, you know, what you want to have them be right on their desk. So if they need to put a hand down for balance, uh, they're able to do that. I hope that's helpful. Great. And there was an, another question. Um, you had a slide up earlier, oh, about 10, 15 minutes ago, where you talked about a research article or a research study. And uh, uh, someone asked if you could uh, give us the reference for that. And perhaps the best way to do that, as I, as I mentioned at the outset, for those that were here, we'll be sending an email to everyone who's participating tonight, plus, plus everyone else who registered but couldn't join us right away. Uh, and I would say, uh, Lisa, if I can get you to send me that reference, I'll include it in that information. Um, okay. And uh, I see I, that I'm not sure which study that was. Was that our study? Um, uh, there was a, a list of there was a list of um, there were a list of studies, and then um, I talked about my own study. Okay. Uh, well, the person who asked the question was Melissa. And Melissa, if you can uh, if you were, if you can answer that question in the chat box, that would help too. Yeah, and that would be great. And actually, she could even send me an email directly as well. Um, and I think at childlightyoga.com. And uh, Lisa, I think you'll see in the in the main room that uh, she's now voted number one a moment ago, uh, which I think would meant that it meant your first. Uh, it was the first of those two that you mentioned. Oh, 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 that's good. So my own study. So yeah, um, if you go to the research page of our website. It's featured there. There's the entire study summary with the po the research poster, the whole, the whole deal. So that that would be where to go. Yogaforclassrooms.com, and then go to the research page. Now here's another question that uh, that comes up. Uh, you know, how do you deal with parents yeah. who think that uh, yoga, you know, the origins of yoga in re you know in religion makes them suspicious about yoga? You know, their kids being yeah. involved in yoga programs. Yes, this is a very timely, a timely topic with the whole lawsuit that just happened in California and all of that. I've actually done quite a bit of writing on this topic, so I, I encourage people to go to our blog and type in religion um, into the search field because you will get probably three, at least three articles on on the topic. Um, I actually wrote uh, an article for Elephant Journal at the start of that whole controversy that was really, really popular and has been shared um, quite a bit, but that'll be linked to even through our blog. So if you just type in religion, you'll get that. One of the things that we do just from a really practical standpoint, when we do our program in school, um, we address the problem well, I shouldn't even say it's a problem. It's not a problem. It is a problem if you don't address the question from the beginning. Does that make sense? So um, what we like to do is we have an opportunity before we do a residency to have parents come in. Maybe it's at an open house when we happen to be there. But we like to do a presentation um, about what our program is and what our program isn't. And then even on top of that, there's something that we call our parent letter that goes home to all of the uh, parents of the students in a school before we start our residency program. And it's typically addressed from uh, the school principal that talks about what our program is all about, what it isn't, what religion is, and how this is not, what we're doing is not religion. So it's just really clear, really straightforward wording. That wording can be found in that Elephant Journal 
article. So if you're willing to um, look that up there through our blog, you'll find that wording. You're welcome to use it. Um, thank you, Lisa. A good answer, and uh, and I that's and it's great to have those um, have those have that blog uh, with the with the Q and A on your website as a reference. Uh, we're getting several. Um, uh, well, I see the last most recent question from B.B. Sanchez in uh, Argentina. And by the way, thank you for joining us tonight, B.B. Uh, uh, it's great to have a, a really international crowd this evening. Um, and of course, B.B. is asking if you can come down to Argentina and do mm -hmm. so here's, training here's, there. Yeah, uh, so that's, and, uh, a, that's, that's such a great question. Um, I would love to answer that question. The easiest thing to do, I'm assuming you're an educator, is to take our workshop that we have right online. So that's beautiful. Our one day yoga for classrooms professional development workshop that school counselors, educators, OTs, and others who are working directly with kids in the school. Um, we have them in 15 states in Canada, but I forgot to mention that same exact workshop is available online. So you can register for that. We send you all of the materials. You log on and you participate at your convenience. Um, it's an 18 segment, uh, sort of a module based thing. Um, and it's, it's been fantastic, and it's really enabled us to reach a lot of people from around the world. And then, Bibi, if you wanted, yeah, good. Uh, if you wanted to continue on, you got really inspired, you're like, oh, my gosh, I want to take this back to my school. I want to teach the rest of my staff this program. I want to do the residency. Then you'll have to come to the state because um, the only place that I offer the trainer intensive is, is here currently, both in New Hampshire and Pennsylvania. And uh, that answers the question for for Sophia, who just asked about Portugal uh, and how to how to uh, gain access to the training uh, from there too. Uh, the residencies, then, just to repeat, you said that because uh, that was the other another question were that which two states do the residency programs take place, Lisa, and, and in what which months of the year? Sure. Um, well, the residency that you're referring to, our residency is our ten week. Uh, program where our trainers go into a school and we present the 10-week curriculum in each classroom. Um, what I was just talking about was our professional development workshop, um, which really anybody can take, any educator can take um, from anywhere. The residency is something different. Our trainers are trained to present the residency, so it's kind of the next level up where the trainers, if you want to continue on from the professional development workshop and become a trainer, then you would gain access to that curriculum and, and have the ability to present that in the school. Oh, this is a good question. Can I answer this? Sure um, can. Jen Hannessy, that is amazing. I live in Dover. Oh, hey, I'm sitting in Dover. I'm in my office on Central F. Uh, and my daughter has taken uh, a class at Child Light right here and loved it. I'd really love to take the training, but schedules are always tough. The online workshop is fantastic. So the online workshop, though, remember, that's the Yoga for Classrooms Professional Development Workshop for Educators. So. Um, if you're talking about the Child Light Yoga Teacher Training, that's something different. That's our, our, our kids' yoga training. It's a full weekend training that enables you to share yoga with children. You're a kindergarten teacher. You're going to love the, the uh, Yoga for Classrooms workshop. Thanks for, for uh, confirming that. Excellent. Great. Well, I think we're, we're through all the questions at this point, unless anyone has a, yet another one to throw in. Um, and I think what I'll do is, uh, pull up the survey at the end. That doesn't mean we still can't uh, ask questions. And of course, yes, uh, I'm glad, Lisa, you've put up your URL there so that people can oh, access the many of the things that you described there sure. uh, in, in the session. So um, Yoga for Classrooms, sorry, just to answer that question, the blog, you can go to yogaforclassrooms.com and there'll be a blog icon right at the top of the page. Perfect. And uh, Lisa, the reason I, I uh, was thanking you for putting that there is that I'm probably going to need you to, there, there may well be other questions come in and I'll let you just sure. take free reign to answer them because it'll probably take me a minute to get the, or two or three, uh, to uh, to open up this uh, URL and I may need you okay. to uncheck the follow box, but don't do that just yet. Okay. Um, I will answer this last question here from Barbara. You are a kindergarten teacher and a 200-hour certified yoga teacher. Fantastic. So you're actually completely qualified to, very qualified, wonderfully qualified to become a Yoga for Classrooms, classrooms license or school site trainer. Um, but the child light yoga teacher training, because you're a kindergarten teacher, I think particularly that training is going to be really fun for you. 
Um, it's a two and a half day training. It's held really all over the country at this point. Um, and uh, it's, it's fantastic and very much focused, I think, focused on ages two to 12, but there's, there's a special focus uh, in that level one training on um, the preschool to, you know, grade two age range. I think you'll love it. In a kindergarten classroom, you typically have a little more space. Maybe you've got like one of the circle rugs or something like that where the kids can actually get on the floor. You know, where yoga for classrooms is very classroom setting based, desks and chairs. Our child light yoga teacher training is very much about, you know, letting kids be kids, so getting them on the floor and so forth. So I, I, childlightyoga.com would be the place to go and look up the child light yoga teacher training. For those of you who are preschool and kindergarten teachers, I highly recommend that. You're welcome, Jackie. Thank you. And Lisa, this is not to uh, to interrupt you. Uh, if there's more questions, let's uh, let's do answer them. Meanwhile, I'll ask people uh, again your indulgence to fill out the survey that'll last but uh, two minutes, uh, maybe less, uh, 60 to 120 seconds. And those that do fill it out, um, you can do it right on the screen, uh, and then hit submit at the end at the bottom of the page. As you scroll down, will be. Uh, eligible to win one of two free uh, subscriptions to Green Teacher Magazine. And it's, uh, but your feedback is important to us, and it helps us uh, decide uh, about uh, new webinar topics and, uh, and gives us uh, you know, candid feedback that's uh, always very helpful. Um, OK, let's see if there's any other comments in the chat box while we're there's waiting there. One question I'd love to answer from Colleen. Um, she asked, how much time do you spend on the sequences, e.g. the centering sequence. Such a great question. I'm so sorry I wasn't clear about that. Um, frankly, you don't even need to do a sequence. You know, sometimes it's just one simple breathing activity or one centering activity that we have time for or that we really need for a given situation or um, child. But um, in our uh, professional development workshop program manual, Yoga for Classrooms program manual, we have an entire section in the back of the manual with all sequences for various amounts of times and particular situations. So for example, do you have five minutes? Or do you have a high energy class? What do you do? Do you have 20 minutes? It's morning meeting. What could you do? That type of thing. So it really depends. It depends on how much time you have um, and um, you know what, what particular needs you're trying to address. And then, and then you take it from there. That's the beauty of these tools, is, is that there are no hard and fast rules with how you use them. I hope that's helpful, Colleen. But Lisa, did you answer uh, Linda's uh, question about, uh, she says, do we get paid by, by the schools to teach yoga in the classrooms, or is it strictly volunteering? Oh, hi, Linda. I think I know Linda. Um, yeah, yeah, so as a trainer, uh, typically you, you, would, you would get paid. No, if you work in a school already and you attend the school site trainer intensive and you become a school site trainer, well, then you're sharing the program as part of your position at the school. So that's, that's different. But if you're, say, a yoga teacher, retired educator, somebody like that who's really interested in becoming a licensed trainer, that's our licensed trainer program, in which case, we give you all the skills and the tools that you need to go back to your own community and approach the schools. You're going to present workshops open to the public, but you're also going to approach the schools and offer uh, staff development workshops in your residency program. So in that case, you are paid. Funding is always an issue. I will not lie to you, um, but we even have some tools to help with that. I think this is probably, uh, this has been a fabulous presentation, Lisa, you did. Uh, you, um, I, I learned enormous amounts myself. I really enjoyed the article that you co-wrote with Martina Ebert in Green Teacher uh, a few issues ago. And, um, uh, and I do encourage people who are still uh, with us uh, to, uh, to go and view it on the, on the Child Light Yoga website. Um, I'm glad you mentioned that. And, uh, and I can, of course, send people a PDF of it as well. But, uh, but Lisa, this was a fantastic presentation. I'm so glad. Glad we were able to reschedule it, and uh, yeah. and you could squeeze us into your busy schedule. And uh, you're doing amazing work, and it's no surprise that this is one of the most uh, popular webinars that we've had uh, at Green Teacher in the four years that I've been doing it. And uh, we're just going to have. I know that one of you may not have noticed, but one of the questions further down on the uh, the survey is, you know, should we do another? Uh, presentation on this topic, and I can only, from the comments I've seen in the chat box, I can only assume that 
there's a re the answer is a resounding yes, right. and uh, so you and I need oh, to talk sure. as well. Oh, so. gosh, I could, you know me, I could go on for years. Any one of those slides could be an entire presentation, so I'm well, I'm very interested. Because well, I got, I got that sense because you, uh, it really was a, it was a whistle stop in one sense, but I don't mean that in a derogatory sense. It was a very, right. it, was a, it was a really rich uh, introduction, and I thought you, I thought what, if I may say, uh, what I liked about your presentation was that, first of all, you started us off with the warm-up exercises, and I thought that gave, first of all, it gave us all a sense of, of the content that we're talking about before we started talking, stepping back from that content and, and talking about the challenges and talking about how yoga in the classroom you know, addresses those challenges and you looked at the research and all that sort of you know, right brain stuff and mm -hmm. you helped us, or left brain rather, and you, you in a way started with the right brain stuff that, that you know, helped us appreciate the importance of the topic on an emotional level. Uh, and physical level before we we dealt with it in an intellectual way. So it was uh, a really excellent presentation, and um, I'm so glad that uh, this worked out and that you and I solved our technical difficulties. Uh, yes, that's a, in the nick of time. Sorry, thank you for everyone's patience. If if you had to wait a few minutes there for us to figure that out, um, I just want to also just before we end here is is to say if you're not already a, scribe, a subscriber to Green Teacher. Uh, magazine, it's definitely worth the subscription. I have them actually set up on next to my my dresser, and I and I grab them on my way to bed and, and catch up on my reading. It's really a, a beautifully rich um, magazine with very thoughtful thoughtful articles. Um, certainly not all related to yoga and mindfulness, but everything really does interestingly tie together, and it serves me well. So I want to give a big uh, plug and shout out for Green Teacher and the work that you're doing too, Tim. Thanks, Lisa. Much appreciated. And uh, good night, everyone, or good afternoon, or a very good morning, perhaps in the, <laughs> almost in, in Portugal as we speak. The sun will be rising there in but a few hours. But uh, but thanks, everybody. And I, we have a another webinar next week uh, on humane education, and I hope you can join us for that or another one further on. And uh, and yes, Lisa, you and I will talk about uh, uh, doing a follow-up. This has been great, and uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Good night, everybody, or good morning. Bye-bye. <laughs>